afternoon. We are pleased to have here Dr. Karim Crow, who is a principal research fellow at the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies in Malaysia, where he performs policy-oriented research into the history of ideas, interfaith issues, and inter-Muslim dynamics. His competence includes civilizational implications of globalizing trends within Muslim societies and their reciprocal relation with Euro-American culture. He earned his doctorate cum laude from the Institute of Islamic Studies at McGill University in Montreal. And he's taught in North America for over 15 years, Arabic language and literature and Islamic disciplines at Columbia, NYU, Fordham, the University of Virginia, and the University of Maryland. He served in Malaysia as Professor of Islamic Thought at the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization, and in Singapore at the Rajaranam School of International Studies. And I am pleased to turn the floor over to him. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Rumi Forum for extending the invitation to share with you some ideas about a topic that is increasingly being raised in different circles and impacts directly on our global reality. The idea that somehow Muslims are not part of the modern scene, that their history, their tradition, their religion in particular has excluded them from what most people understand or interpret to be modernity, and that they have somehow walled themselves off or excluded themselves from engaging directly in issues that the rest of the world is uh, busy undertaking, whether it's economic, uh, political, or uh, issues relating to faith and uh, mutual relations between groups and civilizations and religions. And if you scan the literature, and you see what's being published and uh, discussed in the last decade, especially since 9-11, about the global stance of Muslim societies and peoples across the world, you'll find that there's a recurrent theme that reappears, that the Muslims have a problem with modernity, that they have never really settled or clarified to themselves whether they want to be part of what the globalized, contemporary, modern scene engages most societies. Particularly the issue of secularity, whether Muslim societies can accommodate in some way a secular stance, es especially also the idea of science and technology at the root of those enterprises is a view of rationality that uh, puts the human in charge of their destiny and able to control and master natural forces and advance in terms of the technological mastery of uh, forces which allow people to be part of the modern age. And we find this view now amplified of course, it has a history. There has been a tendency over several centuries, especially during the heyday of imperialism, when the white man bluntly assumed that Asiatics and dark-skinned peoples were just incapable of thinking rationally or of mastering the intricacies of science and technology as it had developed and spread from the time of the Enlightenment, 18th century, primarily in Western Europe, France, Germany, England, and other major European nations. And it was at that time that the suppositions and assumptions which underlie modernity became established and widespread. Now, modernity means the era from the Enlightenment until recently. Most people think of our age as a postmodern age. Modernity represented a break with the authority of religious institutions, particularly the Catholic Church, with its uh, dogmatism and its monopoly of truth uh, and its uneasy relationship with rationality, which 
led to the undermining of faith-based view of the world. And we all know that people like Galileo were tried as heretics because they questioned certain dogmas that the Catholic Church upheld. So the European enterprise, which it spread over the globe, became uh, uh, a means by which certain assumptions about non-European races became accepted without much questioning. Arabs, uh, Indians, Chinese, uh, people of other races were not able to partake of modernity and could not have achieved the same technological and scientific advances that the Europeans did. There was always something unique about Europeans, exceptional. Nowadays, of course, uh, it's particularly Americans who see themselves as some form of exceptional contribution to world uh, advance, economic and financial order, and scientific and technological success. And there was undoubtedly a wash-off effect. Many Muslim thinkers and uh, community leaders who were interested in trying to reform their societies and meet the challenge from the European uh, uh, presence, uh, colonial domination and exploitation, had a inferiority complex. Many of the early reformers, the late 19th uh, and early 20th century uh, in the Arab world and in India and uh, subcontinent and other parts of the Muslim uh, domain, they saw that the way to advance was to adopt the rational worldview and the scientific and technological advances that Europe had clearly demonstrated were superior and effective. And that there were certain aspects of their own tradition, uh, particularly a kind of obscurantistic, mystical obsession, overemphasis on certain spiritual and faith-based disciplines that were holding them back. So there was an implicit sort of acceptance that their view of us has something true. We have to, for example, get rid of these Sufi orders. That was a very popular perception 150 years ago. The Sufi orders, which were so widespread and part of Muslim societies, were seen by many dynamic, young, westernized Muslim intellectuals as obstacles. We see that with Kamal Ataturk, for example, in Turkey and in other parts of the uh, Islamic world. And there was an assumption that we had, Muslims had to catch up somehow. Muslims are caught in this <coughs> dilemma. They have to catch up to try to achieve what has been achieved uh, by Euro-America. Let's use that term rather than the West. Uh, and therefore they have to turn their back on aspects of their own historical social and religious experience, which they see as factors that hold them back. Uh, we see, therefore, that we find Muslim countries who would like to get nuclear technology, or at least industrial uh, technology, or become a base for information technology on a par with that which is dominated and uh, monopolized to a large extent by Euro-American societies. And so the issue became one of why didn't Islam develop its own form of modernity? It's well known that there was a intellectual and rational trend in Islamic thought and history which had sources in the same intellectual and rational experiences that European modernity derived much of its worldview from, the Greco-Hellenic rational tradition of philosophy and science. We know that for close to a millennium, the Hellenic uh, rational disciplines were preserved and cultivated and advanced among Muslims, whereas in Dark Age Europe, they were more or less forgotten or had vanished. They were recovered for the Europeans by a massive translation wave from Arabic into Latin and Hebrew in the 13th and 14th century, primarily through Andalusia. And that uh, body of literature had been transposed from earlier Hellenic sources in the 8th and 9th centuries from 
eastern Mediterranean lands into the central Islamic domains. So there was this double translation flow of thought which preserved Greek or Western science and technology, if you will, the technology of medicine, uh, the technology of engineering which allowed bridges and arches and domes to be built, these type of uh, medieval technologies water uh, systems for irrigation. There's a whole host of related traditional technologies which today we don't necessarily include in our view of technology but which are very important historically. And then of course there's a, a Euro-American perception of why Europe achieved its dominance. Why it achieved a kind of uh, not just technological mastery over the forces of nature but, if you will, a sort of uh, intellectual and even a sort of spiritual superiority over the traditional societies of Asia and other parts of the world. And this has been debated a lot. There was some kind of assumption somehow that perhaps certain economic uh, patterns uh, of uh, early capitalism, uh, certain philosophical assumptions about the importance of the individual, the autonomy of the reason, apart from uh, organized religion, etc., guaranteed or promoted a sort of European dominance which was spread through the colonial enterprise. Recently, a number of different thinkers have questioned these assumptions, which are understood or seen now as very Eurocentric. They put European and Euro-American enterprise in the center of history. Everything else is either far east or, or mid-east, east of where? East of Paris, London, Berlin. Uh, this type of assumption that history really began in 18th century Europe, modern history, and the rest of the world is a reaction, a series of reactions to the developments that uh, European uh, progress and advance promoted. In fact, uh, people who are interested in what they call world systems analysis and uh, what also is understood today as a form of critique of the role of capitalism as a globalizing force for homogenous culture, uh, peripheral capitalism, uh, the so to speak anti or alter globalization view of, of the current uh, reality of our globe have suggested that that's a bit of an uh, overdrawn and exaggerated image. Up until the 18th century at least, technologically and scientifically, there was hardly any difference between Western Europe and countries like China and India and the Middle East. And uh, especially when you look at trade patterns. And furthermore, in terms of the rise of capitalism as a social and political system, uh, in the 19th century in particular, very closely associated with European imperial outreach and expansion in the search for markets. But it is now more clearly understood that it was the new world source of bullion, particularly silver, that encouraged and made possible the dominance of Europe in a global sense, in the, so to speak, golden age of imperialistic reach. Dr. Britain, Kirk, yes? May I just sure, for a point right of ahead. clarity um, for my thinking? So would you be defining modernity in more in terms of your European dominance of uh, in political systems, in financial systems, um, or would you be touching on modernity also as technological developments, or what about like hierarchical structures? Because if you think of Islam and especially Latin Christendom, the, the extent to which you had a very strong hierarchy of uh, clergy in the religious structure in Europe, Latin, particularly Latin Christendom, the extent to which in Islam you had, a, at least in my understanding, a far more diffuse system of authority. Because there's a quote from Alexis de Tocqueville, which I don't know if people are familiar with, that, touch, that sort of touches on this. The extent to which Tocqueville is accurate in what he says about Christianity or what he says about Islam is a matter of discussion. But Muhammad brought down from heaven and put into the Quran not religious doctrines only, but political maxims, criminal and civil laws, 
and scientific theories. The Gospels, on the other hand, deal only with the general relations between man and God and between man and man. Beyond that, they teach nothing and do not oblige people to believe anything. That alone, among a thousand reasons, is enough to show that Islam will not be able to hold its power long in ages of enlightenment and democracy, while Christianity is destined to reign in such ages as in all others. And that was in 1840s in democracy in America. So like, when you're, uh, your conceptualization of modernity, is it this European dominance of the world that combines a number of different factors? Or is it more of a philosophical um, mindset that is not particular to Europe? It's both, of course. Uh, but there's no gain saying that what we understand as modernity started in Europe and therefore it had a specific root, uh, social and uh, economic and political roots in European experience. Not to say that it's uniquely European because all of us are modern. Al-Qaeda is a modern phenomenon. Even peasants in Indonesia are part of the modern world and live a modern existence. The idea that somehow modernity has still yet to be achieved by other peoples is wrong in the sense that it's uh, assum assuming that there's only one form of modernity. There are many ways to be modern. They're not all the same. The question is, Muslim societies are achieving their own form of modernity. Whether it has to be the modernity that Euro-American societies assume to be the one pattern which includes a marked secularization and a retreat of religion from the public sphere and uh, a social and economics pattern that enforces a certain type of uh, social ethos which is uh, undermining the family as an extended institution and uh, ethical values that people cherished for millennium but which now seem to have no utility and also the financialization of society with its uh, insidious way of transforming the relations that people have with material objects and with material values. Uh, these have all become so widespread and taken for granted. All so-called developing countries are basically furthering the Euro-American model of modernity while parts of their own societies are struggling to achieve a form of modern existence which would have room for aspects of their own traditional culture and religion and, so to speak, worldview, if you want to call it philosophy. What I'm really interested in, though, is the role that rationality plays in this. Because the assumption, for example, that Muslim societies are not signing up to the modernity project, as Cardinal Newhouse said, I think he's passed away, and this also popular view in Europe that you know Europe is threatened to become a Eura Eurabia or something because of the large number of Muslim immigrants living and working in Europe whose values are somehow inimicable or antithetical to Euro-American modern social uh, understanding of what life should be and how society is organized. These raise deep issues which tie in with much older embedded perceptions of the other, the Muslims beating at the gates of Europe, the uneasy feeling that Islam is somehow more wedded to irrational and violent and fanatic expressions than modern civilized people in the West are. We recall the speech by Pope Benedict in Regensburg a few years ago, which evoked these deeply embedded perceptions and assumptions. And then the problem, of course, of the global war on terror, which is an open-ended enterprise, uh, the endless war, and which somehow assumes that there has to be an other, civilizationally, strategically, and also religiously, if you will, at least from the point of view of some Christians in the West, the evangelicals, who have a Manichaean vision of existence. So 
the notion that somehow Muslims failed to develop and accentuate the rational legacy within their own tradition, derived in large part from the Hellenic sciences which they had translated, the philosophical enterprise, and also encouraged uh, by various rationalist disciplines which are indigenous to Islam, including aspects of theology and ethical thinking, and a form of mysticism which developed in a very deep metaphysical direction and which combined aspects of rational and philosophical interests with a profound spiritual uh, practice, usually referred to as hikmah, a theosophical approach to philosophy, or irfan, a form of gnosis, and which is still very much uh, alive in countries like Iran. Hans Kung published a book recently, Islam, Past, Present, and Future, the third in his trilogy about the monotheistic faiths. And uh, it's quite popular and has been well received, but it's built on an assumption that the three monotheistic prophetic revealed traditions have gone through a series of paradigm changes or shifts or world views or assumptions about their role in history. And that all three are now faced with a final paradigm shift, which he calls postmodern, which implies a sort of acceptance that there is a secular framework in which people of faith have to make an adjustment or come to terms with, and that the older exclusivist and monovalent ways of looking at truth are no longer valid. People can no longer insist on the exclusive truth claim of their own monotheistic faith against others, which leads to conflict and irreconcilable differences, but rather there has to be an acceptance of relativism, some form of value pluralism, and uh, an adjustment to the demands of modernity. I'm thinking a Catholic thinker like Charles Taylor here in the United States is an eminent uh, example of this type of trend in religious thinking. Hans Kung also in his view of the three religions. The global ethic paradigm which Hans Kung promotes. And even in uh, many circles of uh, progressive and uh, liberal Muslim thinking who posit a sort of shift away from a faith-based worldview and an embrace of a more rationalist, basically Greco-Hellenic uh, understanding of the role of reason and science with faith. So it becomes relegating faith to a, uh, a situation where it has to be one of several claimants to finality and absolute certainty. Now, this attitude, in my understanding, is built on a Eurocentric understanding of what rationality is. That is to say, the reason that Muslims didn't become modern like Europe did was because they denied this Hellenic trend within their own tradition. Ghazali wrote against philosophy and undermined the validity of philosophy in his famous book, Tahafut al-Falasifa, The Collapse of the Philosophers. Rationalists like Ibn Rush, known in the West as Averos, uh, were not accepted and didn't have a legacy in the Islamic world, but were translated into Latin and avidly read and promoted and prompted uh, the scholastic tradition of Aquinas and others, which was in a sense the beginning of a kind of uh, pre-modern form of rationality in European circles. And the assumption that somehow if Muslims had paid less attention to their faith-based and religiously oriented and spiritual components and had concentrated more on the rationalist and philosophical aspects of their own intellectual preoccupations, then they would have been able to develop along the lines of Europe and they would not have been at odds with modernity. The assumption being, of course, that the view of reason implied in this is the instrumental reason of the Enlightenment. Independent, autonomous human reason that exercises control over the forces of nature, that promotes the domination of humans over nature and over society, the ability to plan social and political projects for a kind of utopia on Earth, 
if you will, a sort of inverted view of religion, where religion is here and now. The goals of religion are realized in a material and earthly domain, not in a hereafter and an otherworldly domain, which is the raison d'etre of communism, which is in a sense a, a kind of monotheistic totalitarian religion, if you will. Of course, that's open to debate, but it is often treated that way by people who are interested in the history of ideas and in the spread of modernity. And I feel that one of the misunderstandings that is at the root of uh, um, conflict and uh, tension between the Islamic world and uh, leading Western nations, Euro-America, if you will, uh, is this assumption somehow that those peoples, that large section of the world, are incompatible with our understanding of what modernity is. And unless they shake themselves free of these old-fashioned and backward-looking, religiously-oriented uh, views of themselves and of history, they can never join the advanced nations of the world and be part of the new uh, social and political and economic order that modernity represents in the minds of most Euro-American societies. The fact is that religion is not going away, that people now talk about desecularization, that religion in the public sphere is a reality even in Europe and America, and a political force. And so there has to be a new understanding of the role that religion can play, and that rationality has to also be re-examined. And here, I think that the Islamic tradition has something to offer, which unfortunately Muslims themselves are not necessarily aware of, because they have had a way of overthrowing and of erasing their own understanding of what human reason is and the limits of reason within the total context of their anthropology, the emotional and the social and the ethical aspects of reason. And they've adopted the view of instrumental reason pervaded by the Enlightenment and which is seen as the guarantor of success scientifically and technologically in order to become modern. That's my main point, which I summarized in 10 minutes. Amazing. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Now, when you have, are, are there particular thinkers to whom you would look in the Islamic tradition as articulating um, this vision of reason or rationality? And would you be speaking predominantly from an Arabic-speaking uh, milieu, or would it be broader than the classical Arabic-speaking tradition? Very good question, John. Thank you. <coughs> I had a number of thinkers in mind, and I could have talked in detail about them. Ghazali, uh, the 11th century uh, Muslim thinker who uh, attacked philosophy, actually was extremely indebted to the Hellenic philosophical tradition. And there's a revision going on now of his work and his legacy. There's a very important manuscripts which have been uncovered and are being published by a, a Malay scholar in Oxford, uh, which show that Ghazali himself uh, was heavily indebted to the Avicennan worldview, and that his attack on philosophy was a polemical work done at the service of the state. Uh, he, in fact, encouraged and helped uh, certain aspects of the Hellenic philosophical disciplines penetrate into classical Muslim religious thinking, particularly usul al-fiqh, the legal theory, and kalam, theology, as well as the philosophical ethics. But this has yet to be brought out and uncovered. Most students of Muslim thought would disagree with me based on the consensus up till now. And if you read Hans Kung, of course, Ghazali is one of those, so to speak, black figures who attacks rational, rational enterprise and is responsible for the backwardness of Muslims. Whereas Ibn Rushd is a hero because he was so thoroughly Aristotelian, although Ibn Rushd was one of the leading Qadis magistrates of the Maliki legal school in Spain and uh, became uh, very influential for legal developments in the north uh, and western world of the Islamic Maliki school. And so therefore he had a double role, if you will. And it's very interesting how he could 
so to speak, reconcile these two aspects because it had a double theory. Rationality and philosophy could be pursued because it doesn't encroach on or it doesn't negate or rival the religious sphere of uh, revealed law and uh, uh, legal uh, system which uh, the Muslim social sphere is built on. So he was able to live both lives, so to speak, a total rationalist philosophically and one of the greatest Aristotelian commentators who ever lived and yet a major figure in uh, Sharia uh, developments for Muslim religious thought, right? Ibn Khaldun is another very important figure, and he's often pointed to by uh, European students of Islam who want to point out to an exemplar who could have served as a model to move Muslims towards the more enlightenment view of reason. After all, he was the founder of sociological discipline of history, he was uh, an original thinker who came up with uh, ideas such as supply-side economics. I believe Ronald Reagan used to like to quote Ibn Khaldun in that respect. And uh, various other notions, uh, especially concerning political theory of dynastic change, which were never really pursued in the Muslim world. And uh, it seems to have been a kind of a, a unique exception and he was not translated into Latin and has no Western influence until modern uh, colonial studies of the Arab, North African uh, Islam uncovered him to the Western mind. Although there was an interest in Ibn Khaldun among certain Ottoman intellectuals in the 18th and 19th centuries. But Ibn Khaldun is a bit of an anomaly because he himself kind of turned his back on these earlier uh, philosophical historical approaches of his he was the chief judge of the Maliki Rite in Cairo for many years at the end of his life. And in his final edition of his great book, The Introduction to History, he basically dismisses philosophy and logic as unnecessary or misleading subjects that should not be taught or encouraged. He turned his back on that earlier period when he was the uh, tutor to the king of Granada in Andalusia and wrote special praises of logic and uh, philosophy for him, King Abdullah Ahmar, whom he hoped to train as a kind of philosophical ruler king, uh, applying Plato's theory of the ideal ruler to him. Muslims took uh, Greek philosophy so seriously that they actually attempted to do things like that, which was never done in the West, with the possible exception of some Renaissance figures. And Ibn Khaldun, therefore, is looked at as a possible precursor to modernity. Why didn't they follow his lead, people say, Hans Kung included and others. They could have entered modernity the way the Europeans did if they had embraced that form of rationality. But then they're stuck with explaining why Ibn Khaldun himself turned his back on that in his later years. And uh, they usually end up saying, well, he was too absorbed in his mystical attachments. He was a major figure in a certain tariqah Abu Madian, North African uh, Sufism, and this ob obsession with mysticism, just as with Ghazali, turned him away from rationality and from pursuing rationality to its logical conclusion, which have, would have promoted a more scientific and eventually a more technologically active uh, stance that could have brought Muslim societies into a more modern position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, developments in Europe. To my mind, I think the best uh, examples for us, and here we come across the, the problem that you raise, is it an Arab language phenomenon? Or is there another sphere within the Islamic cultural domain, namely Iranian and Persian, which somehow is more open to a rationalist tradition? As you know, or you may not know, but you should know, that in Iran today, the Hellenic philosophical tradition is alive and well, but in a peculiar form that it developed within Islamic civilization, in which rationalist philosophical disciplines were wedded to a deep form of spiritual practice, and which I mentioned before as hikmah or irfan. People like Ayatollah Khomeini, for example, studied Aristotle and wrote commentaries on works by Aristotle. Uh, he was familiar with Western thought. Most well-educated Iranian religious figures, the Mullahs in the Shiite tradition, have a grounding in Western philosophical thought because they're familiar with the great figures of the philosophical Hellenic uh, tradition, including Plotinus 
and uh, various figures that bridge the world of late antiquity with early Islamic uh, developments. However, Arab Islam seems to have had a vacuum or a blank in this respect. And there was uh, a development after the era of Ibn Khaldun, 13th century or 14th century, until current times, where especially the Sunni world and the Arab Sunni consciousness turned its back on that philosophical and rational tradition and came to identify it with heretical tendencies which were peculiarly Iranian and or Shiite. Unfortunately, uh, this misperception and this antagonism within Islam has been revived recently due to the sectarian bloodshed and the pronounced uh, um, reappearance of a fanatical uh, Sunni jihadist mindset which identifies everything Shiite as being reprehensible and one of the chief features of Shiite intellectual and cultural activity is this obsession and concern with a form of rational spirituality. I call it trans-rational spirituality because it has a room for the Hellenic rational and philosophical experience, but it puts it in a certain domain where it can be transcendent and it's not understood to be the end all or the conclusion of the human intellectual and perceiving knowing enterprise. There's something beyond reason. It's the spiritual perception which is built on a rational and philosophical basis, but which transcends reason, right? And this is something perhaps that the West has forgotten, although you can go back to uh, intellectual and rational figures in Western tradition, where this perception was, of course, understood and cultivated. Meister Eckhart is a good example. Even people like Aquinas and the scholastics had an opening to that dimension beyond the strictly mentation aspect. There's a sort of noetic, perceiving, knowing, grasping aspect, which is the culmination of what we call reason, but which is a higher form of rational enterprise, which is a visionary form and has a spiritual dimension. Razali himself was quite open to that. And in the Islamic tradition, it's a combination of Ibn Arabi, the great Andalusian Sufi master, along with Ibn Sina, the great Iranian philosophical genius, and people like Mullah Sadra, 17th century Iranian Safavid sage, who combines these trends. And this tradition is still alive and cultivated in certain parts of the Iranian-speaking world, although it's not necessarily very, very well known outside of uh, those areas. And as I said before, now it's become to see as problematic by large segments of the non-Iranian and non-Shiite world, which is a problem of intra-Muslim intra dynamics, which must be paid attention to. I always like to tell my friends that Iranian mullahs would understand more about Western thought and culture because they share certain basis, the Hellenic philosophical and rational tradition, which is part of their tradition as well. Whereas Sunni jihadists don't have much in common with Western thought, except perhaps their engineering and scientific training, which makes them to be actually much more modern than we understand or accept, and a little bit more of anarchists, so that their jihadist ideology is actually a form of Western thought to some extent, and is ultimately uh, exercising a very secularizing effect among many Muslims. But this gets into other things that are maybe a little bit too uh, too much to drag into the conversation here. I always try to keep the motto and the advice of the Prophet Muhammad, may God whelm him in glory and give him peace, who said, speak to people according to the measure of their understanding. Well, I don't know time-wise. Okay. Does that be particularly... I still have the floor, so I have a question for you, and then I will allow <coughs> others. In some of, you touched upon some of the um, interactions between various scholars and certain people in positions of political power. I would like in some way to, if you would wish, to revisit this discussion of the, higher, the, the existence of, for example, in Latin Christendom of a clerical hierarchy 
that, for example, when Thomas Aquinas was using the works of um, uh, Ibn Rushd and was commenting on them, that, well, using the works of the commentator and then his use of the philosopher Aristotle, he, Aquinas was often marginalized in his own, even though today the Roman Catholic Church in some way follows a Thomistic method, yeah. at his own time it was not very accepted. If you look throughout history, I mean the, the very concept of rule of law that European and Euro-Americans like to put forth as a um, an ideal to which one society should live up. This in itself was formed in response to the abuses found in European society of both the monarchy as well as the ecclesiastical hierarchies in which there were those who were above the law. So now the law is above all in theory. Whereas in Islam, if like the, the concept sharia, which is well-worn path to a watering hole, in some ways is closer akin to the via vita veritas of the uh, gospel, the Latin translation of the gospel, in which Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In this sense, sharia and its basic concept, Ibn Taymiyyah even has this nice saying about how sharia, some people get confused and think sharia is that which a, a judge, a qadi, rules. No, if the, the Qadi can only rule as well as his intellect discerns and based on the evidence put before him. So if somebody is bringing evidence to him that is wrong but argues it well, the Qadi might rule in favor of the, the wrong evidence. However, in the end, it's, you know, the God is the judge. You know, in a fatwa today, when, classically, whenever a fatwa is issued, it's a legal opinion. And at the end, it's well, I'm and the law, but the but the knowledge is with God. So this concept, and and if you think in the Islamic traditions historically, yes, you had systems of power and authority, but the it was up to the individual to go to the the the, the scholar he or she trusted in order to get an opinion on how he should live his life. Of course, if you disturb the public order you can have like, external sanctions coming in. Now, the extent to which this development of rationality and its acceptance or non-acceptance in different traditions, to what extent might it have to do with the political powers that are in place, or just political situations? Quite a lot. If you want to look historically at the development of Islamic intellectual disciplines, you can find many points relevant to your question, but I, I don't have the time to get into it. As you know, the Umayyad uh, caliphs, the first major dynasty in Islam after the first successors to the Prophet, enforced a kind of orthodoxy which uh, included unquestioning obedience. People who exercised uh, too much intellectual questioning were punished, whipped, beaten, or killed. They enforced their unquestioning obedience in a harsh way. But the Abbasids shift more east, Baghdad. Islam wasn't going to become an eastern Mediterranean cultural force. It was going to become an Asian empire, an Asian civilization. That's a very important shift, by the way. Um, then there was a larger inclusion of non-Arab peoples into the intellectual mix. You see, most of the great intellectuals in the first three or four centuries were non-Arabs. The pure Arab scholars were unusual. They would note, he was a pure Arab. Wow, one of the few, like Ibn Hanbal, Arabi Salib, pure Arab, because most of them were not. They were Persian, Armenian, Aramaic, uh, you know, Syriac, uh, Turkish, uh, Ethiopian, all the different races of the Islamic uh, civilization which found a kind of meritocracy through knowledge. The road to quality was through knowledge. And so the buildup of a, an informal class of scholar experts. You know, Caroline, we don't have, in Islam, we don't have an ecclesiastical hierarchy. Yeah. And even the, trying to point to the Shiite uh, hierarchy in the Catholic Church, there's a lot of people who make that 
parallel, but it's not quite the best uh, model. The point being that there is a kind of democracy of knowledge, at least historically there was, and this was one of the strengths that the Muslim uh, social and intellectual uh, uh, system could offer people. Uh, the other problem is, besides the tendency for the political class to tamper with or to exploit uh, the knowledge class, and there was a kind of a trade-off, the scholars would say, we will recognize your authority, and we will even tell the people to obey you, even though you are corrupt, drink wine, fornicate, etc. Most of the caliphs were not very clean people. Nevertheless, they were symbols of authority and power and that the uh, scholars in Islam came to terms with them and say, we need a, a symbol, we need an overarching figure to whom we can give allegiance and who will allow us, the scholars, to enforce the legal system, the Sharia, which is a kind of blueprint for social, economic, and uh, political activities for the society. So there's a trade-off. We handle the uh, religious blueprint and you allow us to have authority for it, and we recognize your authority and ask people to mention your name in the Friday prayer and answer your call for uh, troops for jihad or whatever, you see? But this trade-off broke down in various times and places, and uh, there was an increasing tendency for the, the scholar class to get co-opted by the ruling class, and this is a natural tendency I mean, it's like here, I suppose, that there are certain sectors of academia who service the foreign policy of the United States and are afraid to be too critical or unorthodox or a, uh, you know, out, off the beaten track when it comes to criticizing what's really in the best interest of the United States in its conduct of foreign affairs. So there's a tendency that uh, governments rely on experts who are trained in their institutions and whom they support to a large extent to meet their needs. It's a very common uh, human uh, pattern. The problem is in the last few hundred years, and here we're getting into another territory, see, the degradation and atrophy of the, of the intellectual and knowledge class among the Muslims. This is a very serious situation uh, to the point now where many, to Muslims. Yes, many uh, so-called Muslim uh, knowledge authorities, I mean, ulama, uh, are suspicious of rationality, uh, identify rationality and um, certain aspects of intellectual di disciplines with a westernizing approach or somehow inim inimical to true Islamic principles. Good Muslims shouldn't do that. The ulama in the past wrote poetry, were interested in astronomy, uh, dabbled in music, uh, were good in math. Take the average so-called alim in the typical Muslim society today, like in India or Pakistan or Indonesia or Malaysia. And they, have, they don't even know about the modern world. They can't tell you the capital of Germany or they, they're very limited in their understanding of the, the world today and uh, their knowledge of their intellectual uh, breadth and the depth of their own Islamic disciplines is adolescent. And that's a charitable way of saying it, you know. Of course, uh, I don't to want to, we don't have to uh, expose dirty laundry. Muslims tend to prefer not to talk about this, but it's an obvious thing which the rest of the world is now commenting on. So you get people who issue so-called fatwas, who are totally incompetent and have no business doing anything of the sort. And yet, the problem is that so many Muslims take it seriously and think that somehow it's a valid legal position that they have to somehow uh, observe or pay heed to, but it's not at all. This, this is a real issue. So uh, we would like that Muslims recover some depth in their own intellectual and rational tradition. And th that they understand Christians that- Christians as well. <laughs> we have all humans. Yeah. If people of faith, and there are people of faith in the United States and in Europe, and they're concerned about the direction that the world is taking. They don't want to see religions fight and clash with these exclusivist claims that cancel each other out. Uh, though that era should have ended and for it to be perpetuated today in the uh, ways that it's being done is uh, very disturbing. But my concern, of course, is with 
what Muslims are experiencing, and also to help non-Muslims have a little bit of better appreciation that the dilemma that Muslims right. face, you see. Uh, we have to hope that the, the rational depth of Islamic tradition, which has a spiritual component, by the way, you see, so the more understanding and sophisticated you become in your thinking, then the better human being you should be and the more compassionate and uh, the more decent you should become. Sure. But what we find in a Western pattern, I mean, you can get someone who's a brilliant genius and invents some, discovers some physical law that benefits everyone on the planet, and yet he goes home and he beats his wife and shouts at his kids and kicks his dogs. He's not any better human being for his knowledge. Whereas what I'm trying to point out is that the Islamic view of knowledge is that knowledge should help transform your individual personality and psyche to become a better human being. And if it's not doing that, then it's not good knowledge. It's True bad knowledge. knowledge, right? And this is something that I think uh, Euro-American society forgot or overlooks often. The best thinkers among us in this part of the cultural sphere understand that and are looking at that and are concerned about it, right? So science and technology has reached a dead end. Why? It's killing us. Look at the planet. So how can we make our knowledge useful and beneficial and not poisonous? Right? This is an issue for all of us, of course. Uh, Muslims maybe ha haven't reached that point because they're still struggling at an earlier uh, level with their own uh, engagement with reason. Okay, are there... Yeah, we can get some questions yes. maybe from the floor. Anybody who would have a question for Dr. Crow? I hope I was comprehensible. I hope I don't sound like a coup. <laughs> <No. coughs> I'm Stanley Kober. Um, I'm with the uh, Cato Institute, but I also studied at Georgetown. I saw that you're at Georgetown. Let me take this out of the Islamic context for a minute in the philosophical context. We're talking about modernity. You mentioned the, ref the Enlightenment. I mean, Germany. Germany certainly had the Reformation, had the Enlightenment, Immanuel Kant. But you had a rejection of modernity with the emergence of the Nazis, basically. Came out of the most advanced society, arguably in Europe. Great university tradition, great deal of knowledge, and yet it emerged. To make the questions short, I am fixed on the question of war. And when I read about the Muslim world now, I read a lot about war in the sense of humiliation, resistance of occupation. And I'm wondering what, what allowed the Nazis to emerge like that, to reject modernity? Humiliation and war, the loss of World War I, the idea of stabbed in the back. You must make good. Is this something common to the human condition? And you know, we're looking at this as an intellectual tradition, but I'm looking at something also more practical here that perhaps deserves some more attention. Do we have, should we answer each maybe question or have collect the... Collect a few, maybe okay. collect a few, yeah. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. How are you? Hello. I'm David Mack of the Middle East Institute. And uh, I'd appreciate it if you would address a question that uh, you haven't um, gotten to uh, so far. And that is the reaction of Islamic thinkers and Muslim institutions uh, to this ongoing debate um, in the West that began in the 19th century between the um, proponents of Darwinian evolution and natural selection on the one hand and adherence to the ideas of creationism and now uh, so-called intelligent design on the other. Other questions? <coughs> yes, uh, the idea of modernity. We all know that the base of our scientific, based on our number systems, came from the Arab world. We know that. So it's not like Arabs aren't modern. Isn't part of it come from, okay, the Crusades, you did mention that, but isn't also the fact that the Mongols afterwards came in and sacked and burned and looted just about anything that it was knowledge in the Arab world, and that kind of set them back into the dark ages. 
and even our own modern society, people think of franken food, and organics. It's like, come on, they had that back in the 1776. Where did it get them? Maybe. I'm yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I, I really got your question. I mean, it's true the Mongols did a lot of destruction, and they uh, they destroyed the central Islamic uh, lands, uh, but they rebuilt and they imported uh, captured populations and artisans, and they created actually a rather rapidly a new high-level form of artistic and uh, uh, social uh, uh, achievement. So it's a double picture with them. They, they, they wipe away and then they, and they rebuild. It wasn't just all negative. Uh, we have to take that into uh, balance, into account. Uh, modernity could have emerged before, even in Europe, in the sense that we understand it today, a new vision of the human, a new role for uh, the person as an individual liberated from the tutelage of a dominant uh, religious institution uh, or uh, some kind of monarchical uh, pattern where people have to obey authority blindly. And th th it's true that th there could have been moments in historical experience when something modern could have emerged, uh, modern in our understanding today. Uh, but that didn't happen. I mean, we're looking at what did happen. And the widespread perception somehow that Muslims haven't become modern yet and not like us, so something wrong with them. They can't be modern because their religion is teaching them to be unmodern or whatever. That's all I'm trying to address here and uh, uh, show some aspects that would put that simplistic view in question. Right? Uh, coming back to the first question, uh, uh, which I believe, if you can jog my memory, Claire. War. Uh, War and the situation that might have led to a rejection of modernity in Germany and yes, the occupation Yes, yeah, the, the, the Nazis. Um, you say they're anti-modern, and I understand what you mean in, in the sense that they're anti the civilizing and humanistic uh, spirit of, let's say, the 20th century, which we hold uppermost as one of the characteristic features of our modernity, but you know, as some very astute students of the Enlightenment, especially German people in their study of uh, National Socialism, which is the official word that the Nazis used for their ideology, they made the point that actually Nazism and Fascism were, stu were the children of the Enlightenment. And that in a sense it's a kind of logical dead end of Enlightenment forces, or even the anti-Enlightenment in order Romanticism, and then the positivists, that the idea that social engineering and mastery of science and technology can produce a paradise here, or a perfect society, or a perfect realm, or a perfect state, and that it had to be centralized and authoritarian, otherwise it wouldn't work well. And in a sense, it's, a it's, it's one of the bastards of the Enlightenment, if you will. It's the dark side of the Enlightenment, same with communism. And there's the very famous book, I mean, the, the Dark Side of the Enlightenment, which goes into this in depth by two German authors, their, their names escape me, but it's well known if you Google the name Dark Side of the Enlightenment, you would come up with this famous book that exposed for the first time and made people aware that the Enlightenment included some very unsavory things, including mass murder of the type indulged in by a Stalin and Mao. And so I have to take it a little bit uh, a more complex thing and I'm not an advocate of Nazism by any means, but in a way, it's a modern phenomenon. Our problem, of course, if I may just step beyond that, we're all orphans of the Enlightenment. And we're searching for a new way of seeing how we work together, a new way of having a common life in a society which includes so many pluralistic and multi uh, uh, cosmopolitan aspects, we can no longer go back to the cocoon of our monolithic identities that we're all Muslims here, like if you go to Arabia, but then when you see Saudi Arabia, all the workers who do the menial jobs imported from Southeast Asia and India and Bangladesh, and you realize it's no longer a monolithic place, right? And uh, I mean, I remember going to the Gulf and the guy taking my 
bag from the airport and I saw the, the Christian cross tattooed on his wrist. He was an Indian Christian, right? You know, but he was the guy who handled the baggage for you into your taxi. Right away you were met by a Christian when you entered that Muslim country. It was a little bit of an insight into the social reality. And if anyone has been in the airport in Dubai or in uh, Sharjah, they know it sounds like you're in Islamabad, all the Urdu being spoken. So we have this new reality. And it's impossible for us to go back and capture a, a monolithic view of ourselves, our religion, our society, pure, unadulterated. We're all jammed up together. Our, your armpit is in my face, and we can't escape each other anymore. And that's our reality today. We have to find a way to, we can, you know, not just coexist or tolerate each other, but we can actually have some kind of a conversation and uh, get to know each other a little better. The third question, very interesting also, uh, my limited time, I'm not going to do much beyond what, uh, but what can be done in, in a simplistic way, but your point somehow that, and again, you can help me, Claire, uh, you're Darwin. Quite, yeah, the, 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 the ev evolutionary uh, teaching versus intelligent design and its historical uh, background or a no. contemporary how, how have contemporary Muslim thinkers responded to this debate that started in the 19th mm. century and is ongoing uh, there's, in our own country right. and there, there's no one response as far as I'm aware there's a, a spectrum uh, Many people of faith in the Islamic uh, domain are inclined to be skeptical about Darwinian uh, evolutionary claims, especially the idea that somehow the, the primate species is our direct ancestor. Uh, but on the other hand, there are some people who would like to somehow incorporate Darwinian evolution into some form of Islamic scientific uh, uh, awareness. You have certain thinkers who talked about the the fact that the fossil record and mineral and animal and uh, higher forms of animal uh, life have some connection with the human uh, appearance or some uh, input into the human existence. So uh, the, historically there has been some openness to that view, but not in the modern evolutionary sense of Darwinian uh, uh, thought that most Western thinkers would expect or understand. I think that it's an open question. We don't have the same debate as much uh, in uh, Muslim circles, except by those people who are imbued with Western ideas and who think that somehow Darwinian thought is integral to the scientific and technological view of modernity. Mm -hmm. And if you reject Darwin, somehow you reject the assumptions that modernity and everyone else accepts. So therefore you have to somehow accept it in a way that doesn't seem to contradict your dogma or your creed, right? So there is, a, there is some attempts to do that. There is some literature on the subject. Uh, but on the whole, I would say that it hasn't been very well thought out. And there are also very uh, purist and uh, even some formidable and deep uh, attempts to, uh, to deny that the Darwinian thesis is scientific at all. And there are Western scientists who also are open to that uh, idea that it's not something that's proven but that it's a hypothesis that many people accept but, but could be re-examined. I, I don't think I should say more than that about it because it's not something that I am particularly well uh, informed about. And I think it's interesting, the scriptures, because the Bible has <coughs> the statement that God, that, or the Judeo-Christian belief is that man <coughs> is created in the image of God. And in Judeo-Christian tradition, woman is generally seen as being not created in the image of God, as woman was made from the rib of man, and then woman has all sorts of other difficulties in the Judeo-Christian tradition. In Islam, in the Quran, you have God creating mankind, but from the same nafs, so the same soul, the same essence. And, you do, and it's not, you know, God breathes in to uh, creation, but does not create, it's not in the image of God. So the whole discussion of anthropomorphism. I, I, with, with apologies, I, Caroline, I would say that that Claire. is a <laughs> misstatement of the um, first chapter of Genesis, which says God created Adam, right. which is mankind. Right. Male and female. He created, created them. 
and so, the Christian, yeah, okay, yeah, then so I should that's, amend that's, for that's the Christian really, tradition. That's really very much the same uh, No, but as in the, the image, as that's the, my emphasis. As the, well, I think uh, all the children of Abraham tend to share pretty much a similar view about this. Right, but I'm just making the point that the difference between emphasis on being created in the image of God, which I think lends to some difficulty in particularly contemporary Christian understandings, certain trends, particularly in the United States, of the ability to accept uh, Darwinian understanding that man descended from animals as opposed to being created by God in the image of God. By and large, in the, at least in my experience in Arabic speaking, uh, Muslim countries, you'll have Quran class and then you'll have science class where evolution will be taught and it's not seen as a uh, conflict of, you know, they're two separate realms. But and there's an I increasing concern to kind of integrate, you know, that the religious data which is taught has to also be rethought and presented in a way that has points of contact with our contemporary curriculum of science and math and others. And uh, we know that in Islamic uh, experience, how can you understand the way that Islamic art and design was created without having a really good uh, use of math? And uh, the thing is that modern Muslims today can't recreate those designs, except a few artists living in London and <laughs> New York uh, who are doing marvelous work, by the way. But the point is that uh, when they look at the architecture of the past, they don't ask themselves, how did they do that? Can I go home and sketch and measure and get something similar? They just look at it without comprehension that this is an amazing uh, uh, achievement. Four years ago, that article in Science Journal, main science journal, about mosque pattern designs in Afghanistan and Iran from the 13th century, and then these, this Japanese and American uh, mathematics students did the math on the design and they were amazed. They said, the principles, the mathematical principles of this design were discovered 30 years ago in Cambridge. But how did they know it for 800 years ago? I mean, or, or was it intuitive? There was a theory that they reached the design in a higher rational mode, which is not clunky and mechanical down here adding and subtracting and doing formulations, but kind of visionary, like they got the design at a higher level. I don't know, but it's interesting. And there are probably many other things like that that have never been really looked at carefully or brought out. Now there's an interest now in some circles, like in my institute, where we try to think about, let's redesign a mathematics course, but with some Islamic design principles to show modern mathematics students that there's an aspect about Islamic achievement which could be, you know, you should at least be aware of. I mean, you may not be able to duplicate, but at least you should understand that, hey, we weren't so stupid after all. I mean, we did do some things that are quite amazing. It's hard to understand. Um, but I would like to mention about Adam, Jafar al-Sadiq, who was the great-great-great-grandson of the Prophet Muhammad, was asked, the Jews say that Eve was made from the rib of Adam. He said, they're lying. God had some leftover clay, and he made Eve out of it. It's the same clay as he made Adam. Right. Now, that's a very simplistic answer. But on the other hand, we have what Rumi said. And this is the Rumi forum. Would you allow me to quote? Yes, yeah. that would be a fitting conclusion. He says, Qalib as ma est, ne ma as u. The form comes from us, not we from it. So there's something essential inside the physical human, which is really us, and it's not derived from our material pattern, you know. And that's a very profound insight that uh, Rumi uh, put in his Mesnavi, right? Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank you very, very much. And thank you all for your uh, participation. And we will, you can join us afterwards for uh, lunch and reception. Thank Thanks. you for listening. Thank you.